It is so good to see you here this morning. If you are joining us online, we are so glad that you've come to worship with us, and we are right here in the family of God. We are glad that so many are starting to trickle back in, and uh, and I know there are still some out there that are struggling with COVID and the all the byproducts and other issues, health issues. We want to continue to lift them up in prayer, but we are so glad to be back as part of in-house worship in the family of God, and I just want to say thank you. Again, a couple of things happening today at 4 p.m. is a church council meeting, so if you're one of our ministry area leaders, we encourage you. That will be in the old fellowship hall, and then at 5 p.m. is the children's Bible drill, third through sixth grade, and all that goes on, that'll be in the fellowship, the old sanctuary, the fellowship hall itself, that, the, old fellowship, the old sanctuary, the new fellowship hall. So all that over in the other building, so we're, that starts tonight. Regular Sunday night activities, the plan is to phase that back in starting next Sunday night. So team kids, adult Bible study, all the different events, what that will mean, that's all at 5 o'clock, except for the Bible drill. That'll bump back up to 4 so just be aware of all that and calendaring and everything that's going on, so many different other things. So I encourage you to be here tonight. We want to encourage you to be praying for and keep list, listening up and maybe send cards and reach out to those that are struggling. Uh, Mary Nichols is the card of the week. Every week we just, it's, we just pick one particular person to encourage you to write them a letter, but don't stop at that one. There are others. And sometimes a text, an email, or even a, a, those things that put stamps on. You remember those? Okay, even those things just brighten people's days to let them know that they are not alone, that they are part of the family of God and we continue to lift up. I believe everybody in our church has power back, so that's good. We're, we're excited about that. So as our praise team makes their way down today, we're going to be reading, we're going to be in James chapter 1 as we continue, as we've just kicked off our series on the, gospel, the letter of James and and what God is telling us in the letter of James. So we're glad about that. And we'll pick that up in just a minute. But we are here today to worship Him. We are here today to lift up praises in our voices. So I do encourage you, you know, it is, even if it's you're at home, go ahead and sing out loud. Uh, and as I grew up, in most of my life, I spent an apartment life. So singing out loud, it was, you know, the neighbors heard you. And that was kind of creepy sometimes hearing what they would sing. So I kind of countered it. But, you know, we're out here in Evergreen and Appomattox. Not everybody's too close, so you have to sing a little louder for your neighbor to hear you. All right? So we want to make sure. So let's all stand up, and let's do one thing first. Wave to somebody that you think they look grumpy. Okay? That they need cheering up. <laughs> all right. First of all, thank you for none of you waving at me. I appreciate that. Uh, second, if, if you got waved at, this is your hour to be encouraged because we are here to lift you up too. We lift high the name of Jesus, but we also encourage and lift up our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So we are here to worship Him. Would you bow with me as we begin our worship with praise? God, it is you that has brought us together. It is you that changes our hearts. It is you that gives us reason for living. And it is you that we are singing about, God. It is you that we will follow. So, Father, today and every day, we lift your name on high. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's sing some songs. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust. 
you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. You love, I love. How you serve, I'll serve. If it's by the peace, I will follow. Where you go, I'll go. When you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. You love, I'll love. Be seated for just a minute. So here we are. James, a letter from a pastor's heart, prodding us to serve, prodding us to have faith that is real, a real faith that works, one who is more concerned about our walk and less about our talk. So in a world that challenges us, we have an attitude of joy. 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And in a world where people will come against us, where life is difficult, where what we think is due doesn't come to fruition, where people disappoint, where life challenges, and where life riles our very being, he says this, Know this, my beloved brother, that everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So be careful in your words, for words have power. So James tells us this, So also the tongue is a small member. Yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Too many people see Jesus as their brother and less as Jesus as their Lord. He is our Lord, our Master, our Savior, and we are to serve Him for Jesus is Lord. James, a bondservant, a doulos, not the brother, not the but leader of the Jesus' church, not an apostle, he calls himself a servant. So James says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So how does this faith show itself? James is more concerned about our demonstration than he is about our declaration. So he writes, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Religion is pure and undefiled before God. The Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So in all of this, we serve others as we serve Him. Our faith is real. And it is to be a real faith that works. So James writes, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him if a brother does, can faith save him if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to him depart peace be warmed and filled but you do not give them things which are needed for the body what does it profit Those, uh, thus also faith by itself if it does not have works is dead James challenges us faith real faith Real faith works. Would you stand as we continue in our singing? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest but holy lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Heaven and his flow support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. With trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, rest in his righteousness alone, all less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is 
That is our prayer, that you would change our hearts, that you would draw us close to you, make us more like you in each and every step we take. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be dismissed, except for our children. We invite you to go ahead and be dismissed to Children's Church. That is in the old sanctuary in the Fellowship Hall. We encourage you. Um, BJ, are they prepped to know how to do all that? Good. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to James chapter 1. Uh, we will be kicking off back into writing out the book of James. Months ago, we kind of started this event to challenge you. Each person could write out one verse. There's 108 verses in the, in the, gospel, in the letter itself. So if we can get 108 people and we write it out, we're going to print it out and kind of our handwriting, we get the own copy. So what I've decided to do since we kind of had the break and COVID and everything else, that I will also be doing inserts every week. And then what we're going to do is at the end of all this, we will print out not only your handwritten verses, but hopefully we have all the inserts and you can have that together to kind of put on your shelf and kind of a little, little Bible study, a little devotional on the book of James. Now we are in the book of James and we're going to be talking about several different things. And one of the things in this real faith works today, we're going to be challenged about four points, but the first one is the person. And to be fair, we really looked at that last week. So what, since I didn't have an insert last week, I actually gave you on the back one side is week ones, all this about the young skeptic to the humble witness, because it was the power of the resurrection that changed James, the person. And James. But someone sent me a text, uh, and I had forgotten about this. There is a video out there of what would it be like growing up as James with Jesus as your big brother? So many of you are familiar with a comedian called Michael Jr. We're going to show you a short clip. Now, I want to give you one little caveat. At the very beginning of this video, you see the picture of the congregation. It is a pretty good-sized church. 
this is the church where my son goes. Not the one he works at. Actually, that's bigger than the one he goes to. But this is the church where my son goes. So if you look really close, you won't see him. So, so let's watch this video. What would it be like as Jesus' little brother? I like reading the Bible. I was reading the Bible. Found out, uh, found out Jesus had a little brother. Anybody know his name? James. When I read that, I was like, Phew. How much pressure was that? <laughs> Jesus, your big brother? How many times do you have to hear, why come you can't be more like Jesus, James? Because <laughs> you know, everybody probably thought that James could do the same thing Jesus could do, but he couldn't. He was just James. He wasn't James Christ. <laughs> Remember the wedding banquet? Jesus turned water into wine. Everybody was amazed, but they don't tell you about the next banquet. Jesus left early. They started running out of wine. Everybody looked at James. <laughs> it's like, man, last time this happened, your brother made some wine, dude. You, you just gonna stand there with your sandals on? You're not gonna... <laughs> can you make some Kool-Aid or something, man? You're not gonna do anything? <sighs> and you know James had problems just like any other kid had problems. He would try to follow his big brother around. So everywhere Jesus went, James followed him. That's what little brothers do. So if Jesus went there, so did James. I bet one time, James almost drowned. <laughs> oh, you just got that joke just now, didn't you? <laughs> Jesus walked on water and then James tried to make this one. I'm sure James had problems. He would go to his parents with his problems. And his parents, especially his, his mom, was trying to throw him a bone once in a while. They'd pray over their food. They're like, Lord, we just thank you for this food. In James' name. <laughs> James had problems. He would go to his parents with his problems. And you know what they would say? He'd be like, well, what would Jesus do? You know? Then they gave him a bracelet. They gave him a bracelet. And um, <laughs> then he started selling those bracelets. You know? <laughs> Made some money selling bracelets. What would be cool is a what would James do bracelet, right? Same initials, different meaning. <laughs> Completely different meaning. You're driving down the street, you get cut off in traffic. You fuss him out, your pastor's gonna be like, yo, you got a what would Jesus do bracelet on? You're like, uh uh, that's what would James do. <laughs> driving an imaginary car for a long time, isn't he? <laughs> also found out when Jesus was 12 years old, Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. They lost Jesus. And you know the first thing they had to do was pray. I wonder what that prayer must have sounded like. Joseph probably did the prayer. He was like, oh, God. Dear God, um, oh, forgiving God. Um, you remember that Messiah you gave us? You got another one somewhere, man? We don't. That was the only begotten son? Okay, we're going to find him. We're going to find him. On my own, but it's just, it's James. I mean, it's, so. Um, it is, can you imagine growing up? as Jesus' little brother. And uh, it just, I can't imagine that concept. But we did get, into, to get a little bit more serious, we did get into the aspect that James did not really like his big bro. He thought he was mad. He thought he was a skeptic of who God, who Jesus was. And, you know, he even just kind of wrote him off until one thing changed where it shows in Corinthians, it shows in Acts where it says that Jesus appeared, the resurrected Jesus appeared to James. And it is that strength that we have that this, the power of recognizing that Jesus is risen from the dead changes the everything. 
It is a game changer for us that we know we don't have to worry about anything else because Jesus is alive and he is victorious. No matter what this world throws at us, we know we win. We, well, we know he wins and we're on his team. He's on our team. So in that aspect, we're going to be looking at James, where he is this pastor now. He is the leader of the Church of Jerusalem. And we talked about last week that in this point, they're coming to an aspect of the church is changing. One generation is passing away. The church demographic is changing, not just Jewish believers, but now Gentiles in not just Jerusalem, but Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And to be honest, that is the plan that God had all along. He did not have a plan for a church to get into a little congregation, to stay in their little comfort zone, and to be happy and growing right inside these church walls. He has a plan for us to grow, to go out, to minister outside these walls. We come together, yes. But what does he say? As you're going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. What? I am with you. Not just in Jerusalem. Not just inside the walls right here at Evergreen. So we have this great power that God is with us. So as we dig into this letter of James, we're going to see this great concept of him encouraging, of prodding, and letting us know about our faith and how real faith works. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up to James chapter 1, and let's get started. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Okay, that's where we're stopping. (laughs) That's as far as we're going to get today. Because that verse itself says so much. And I want us to get the big picture of what James is trying to do. We're going to see three specific things, and I hope you see these as we look at James 1. We are going to see the fact that not just the person, but the priority, which we saw last week, but the priority, the people, and the point of the letter of James. The priority of what is he really writing about? What is the reason? What is going on that kind of prompts this letter? The people, who is he writing to? And the point, what is he really trying to get across? James could have written James, the half-brother of Jesus, and that would have carried a lot of weight. That would have said something amazing. That would have opened doors. That would have perked people's ears to pay attention. But what does he do? James, the servant. You see, he doesn't ever push the fact that he's Jesus' half-brother. He doesn't ever play the family card. He doesn't see Jesus anymore as his half-brother. He sees Jesus as his Lord. And I think that's the priority that we need to get to today. Is that too many people see Jesus as their brother and not as their Lord. I am joint heirs with Christ. I am a child of God. Yes, Jesus is the only begotten, the second part of the, of the, uh, the Trinity, but I now am going to rule and reign with him. And we see this concept, but we forget the aspect that Jesus calls us to serve. Yes, he's our friend. Yes, we're joint heirs. But over and over, you need to realize that we are servants. We are his And this concept of doulos, the the Greek word doulos of bondservant, is not this slavery of, of, of pushing down and oppression. It is this concept that you have willingly said, I will follow you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your ways will be my ways. I will walk in the footsteps of my Savior, my Lord, my rabbi, yes, my teacher, yes, my, my friend and my mentor, but also he is my God. James' priority is I am a servant of God, and I want you to know that you are servants of God too. And as servants of God, the priority is you are to serve him. And servants to God, it's more about your walk and less about your talk. Or as one pastor said, it's more about your demonstration and less about your declaration. 
And one pastor said it this way, and when we follow God, when we follow Jesus, uh, now Lynchburg Airport, as great as a mighty Lynchburg Airport is, it's kind of small, all right? Now don't get me wrong, I lived in a little town called Ball, Louisiana. Y'all kind of say, how do you adapt coming from Dallas to Evergreen? Evergreen is big compared to Ball. Ball, Louisiana, and the entire parish, that's what they call counties, did not have one single red light. Okay? There was an airport whose lobby was about as big as our old sanctuary. And you had a walkway to a, another room about our small fellowship hall of where the luggage baggage was. And you, I lost my mother in that thing for 20 minutes. It'd be like, here, you're looking for your kids, so you go to the fellowship hall, and they go down to the old fellowship hall. And my mother, we literally, for 20 minutes, were circling the airport on opposite sides. How can you get lost in that? But in Dallas and in Austin and other big airports, you know, at, uh, Atlanta, they have these walkways that move. You know what I'm talking about? Right? And when you're following God, to me, that's kind of what it is. You're walking, but you're really walking by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you may get tired and stop, but what? You keep going. And when you're walking by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you're serving Him and walking His ways, you start to see other people in this world, and you're just passing them by. Not that you're ignoring them, but you realize without the power of God in their life, they're going to be stalled. They're going to be, they're going to be stopped. And you, as we follow Him, there is a priority to this. And a servant... A servant to God does this. He has absolute loyalty. The doulos is one who says, I served unto you, but now I am willingly. And they would put you against the wall. They would pierce your ear. And we've talked about that in the past. But in this concept, you, are, you show absolute loyalty. And what does God say? What is the number one commandment? To love the Lord your God with some of your heart, with some of your heart. Some, no, what? All your heart. That doesn't mean I can't love my wife. That doesn't mean I don't love my kids. But it means when it comes to really the priority of everything in my heart, in my mind, in my will, it is all about God. All about God. And I want to be the best parent, the best husband, the best pastor, then the best thing I could be is the best follower. Absolute loyalty and absolute humility. Jesus tells his disciples, if you want to be first, what? What? you got to be last. You serve others. And that is completely upside down from what this world says. And James is writing to the early church, and he says, look, the priority is you follow him, and that means absolute loyalty, absolute humility, and also absolute obedience. It's not, I will follow God when it's convenient. I will obey God when I agree with him. Oh, that may be the way you live, but that's not being a true servant. A true servant is, God, if you say it, I'll do it. Husband, love your wives. That is a commandment. You don't understand my wife. Doesn't matter. Children, honor your parents. But my parents are old, like crypt keepers. They don't understand a thing. You know, they grew up in, you know, my parents, they were like born in 1980 or 1880 for Cecil. God doesn't say honor your parents when they deserve to be honored. What? Honor your parents. It doesn't mean you honor what they do or it doesn't mean you always have to agree with what your parents say, but it does mean they're your parents and you honor them. As servant of God, gives absolute obedience to the commands of God. So the priority of James is you're losing the apostles. The New Testament hasn't been written. None of it. James is the first book in the New Testament that was written chronologically. And James starts to write to the church. of We're going to see the people in a second. But he's giving them the priority. The church is in flux. The church is getting ready to change. And you need to realize that Faith is not about an institution. Faith is about the person, Jesus Christ. And that's the person to whom we are loyal, humble to, and obey. And if this church ever goes against Jesus Christ, walk away. 
That's the priority that James is writing there. James, to the people in, 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 that have been dispersed, the Jewish believers. He is, to the people here, it is the scattered Jewish Christians. All right, now, some of you that are OCD have already noticed there's a typo. Wandering should have an A. Well, to be fair, it could be this way too, okay? It could be they were wondering what's going on in life. So give me a break, all right? You can criticize me later. If you're online and YouTube, you check my spelling. Eh, moving on, all right? But he is writing to the scattered Jewish. Now, here's the point. They were scattered because of persecution. They were scattered because the, not only the Jewish Pharisees and religious organizations started to persecute the Christians. We see what Paul did. And so they started to disperse. They started to get away from Jerusalem. And that's cool, to be honest with you, because it took the persecution to do what God was telling them they should have been doing all along. You were to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But they were happy right there in Evergreen. We don't want to go anywhere. Let's stick here. When my parents moved away from Mayberry... Literally, Mayberry, Mount Airy, all right, they grew up there. Everyone in Mayberry thought my dad was crazy. Why would anyone want to ever move away from Mount Airy? Have you been to Mount Airy? Not a single Starbucks. Okay, moving on. Okay, there's some coffee shops there. There's only one barber shop. You got to go to Floyd's, all right? Uh, I'm sorry. If your Aunt Faye, if you're watching this, I'm just kidding. I'm not. Okay, uh, But it is the aspect of, you know, God tells us to get out into the world, but we sometimes like to hunker down right here inside this church. Matter of fact, I truly believe, I wasn't here, but I truly believe five years ago, God allowed the tornado to get this church outside the church walls. And one of the things, and I know in so many ways, some of y'all are so defined by that event, and that's fine, because it was traumatic and dramatic. But one of the things that y'all talked to me when I was coming here a little over two years ago was this, that we want to use the momentum. We want to use that energy, that mojo, that feeling of we are here to comfort and reach out and be a lighthouse and a zone to our community outside these walls. It's not just come to us. We need to get out there and minister to them. And that event, as heartbreaking as it was, moved y'all outside your comfort zone. And y'all had to get involved. The Jews were being spread out. And James was the pastor to the early church of Jerusalem. So his... his congregation were Jewish Christians. But just like they were wandering away, I like the idea that people today also are wandering away from the church. And God may be using that to get them into the world. With an A or an O, any way you want it, I don't care. All right? But it is this priority to the people. And it is this point that God is using us. Out of the religious comfort zone, into a culture that confronts one's belief, Walk that tightrope. We've got this graphic. It's on both sides. And I know the, the, you can't read the bottom line, okay? But you can probably see real faith works, right? Uh, matter of fact, Donald, can you go back to that first slide uh, with one more? With, do I have the one with the real faith? The, I'm getting epileptic. Oh, there we go. <laughs> As we circle the drain there. Real faith works, and it actually says underneath uh, a series on the book of James. But if you can't see it really, the letter I is a person walking a tightrope between two cliffs. All right, it's on your, it's on your bulletin, it's, you know, so it's out there. This is why we're going to the phrase. And the concept of this, and I want to thank Brandon for actually, I gave him the idea and he kind of worked up this concept. So tremendous, tremendous little work. But it is this point, in a world where we are walking a tightrope to follow Jesus, where culture is all around us, and if you look down, they are ready to devour us. There are like alligators and piranhas and everything, dinosaurs down there, that if we would fall off this tightrope, they are ready to consume us. So real faith continues to walk the tightrope in this world, and we stay faithful in that tightrope, even though it is skinny and narrow. Jesus says what? That if you follow me, it's a narrow path. But it is solid and we continue to walk across this in a world where culture is tugging at us. 
James says, this is a culture that will come counter Christianity. And if we think 21st century culture is against the church, the first century church had a culture just as bad and just as wicked and just as evil. It may be even more so. So to these people, James is writing with a priority that they are to be servants of God. So here's the point of what it's all about. In this messy journey, in this travel through life that we have, James is writing a guide, almost a map, a GPS directions. And in 108 verses, he has 59 commands of telling them to do things. And he's telling them, people, you are in a mess. But in this tightrope, I want to know that faith will give you stability. Faith will give you patience. Faith will give you, bring you maturity. But not just faith that sits still. It's the faith that is up and active. Faith will bring humility. Faith will bring love. James is going to share a word to the first century church. And I want for just a few minutes to challenge you about something. I think he's got a word for you. If you're coming here in the next three to four months, we'll take a little break around Easter, but the next three to four months as we walk through James and you're sitting here going, I'm going to learn about the Bible and I'm going to write out notes and I'm going to just be, you know, just like a classroom where I'm just going to study the book of James and go home and I want you to know, no. I am going to be stepping on your toes. I am going to be prodding you. I am going, I want you to know James is talking about you are messed up. All right? You've got problems. You've got issues. You need therapy. And I'm getting ready to give you the therapy. And you sit here going, you're right. I look around this congregation and these people are. Okay? All right? Remember who you wave to that's grumpy? Yeah. He's grumpy. No! James is going to be talking about... Now, you may not be in every situation... But let me walk through some of this that somebody here is dealing with. Issues that James is going to to face. And and I'm I'm not going to give you the answers. I'm just going to give you some of the issues. Number one, he's going to say, some of you out there are facing trials. You're going through some heavy-duty stuff. And what does James tell you to do? Smile. Count it all. That's your part. Count it all. Okay, joy. Count it all. There you go. Smile, people. Man, the pastor's making me talk. It's a trial. Smile. James is in here. He says, count it all joy when you count various trials. Not sometimes, not just certain ones. Count them all joy. And some of you are facing trials. It may be something called children. All right? It may be something called parents. I have not seen my mother for 11 months. Starting tomorrow, March, will be 12 months that I have not seen my mother because they have quarantined her in a nursing home. And every week my mother calls me and she forgets the last 11 months. That's one of the joys of her dementia. Every week she thinks she's in a brand new room and they've kidnapped her and all that's going around. All right? So that's okay. I'll talk through the same conversations and we have the same. But it is the point of She misses, she knows she's in a new place. She doesn't know how long she's been there, but what she does know is she's alone. She thinks she hasn't seen me for three weeks. Some of you are going through trials. Some of you are going through temptations. It says in verse 3, get over to the, it says, eh, sorry. It says in verse 3, it says this, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. This concept of temptations, this testing, it's different than trials. You're actually being tempted. And there's some of you out there, and there's other places in James in the Bible, that you are being tempted to get off the tightrope. And the danger is you get off that tightrope, you're going to fall. It looks so comfortable down there. It's like green grass. That's not green grass. That's flesh-eating bacteria on the top of the water. All right? Some of you are facing trials. And James is saying, I'm going to deal with this. So how do you, how do you respond? You'll have to come back. I'm not telling you today. Some of you are, in, and so you kind of get mad at that. I want to know now. So that some of you are actually being, dealing with temper. 
What does it say in verse 20? It says in verse 20, the anger of the man does not produce the righteousness of God. And some of you are mad at the world. You shake your fist of what's going on in Washington. And don't get me wrong, they're all idiots. I'll get down in a minute about words. That's one thing I'm struggling with. All right? But some of you are dealing with anger. You're mad at your parents because they don't understand or they won't let you or they won't buy you something. Suck it up. That's my philosophy of counseling. Move on. Get over it. This too shall pass. I'm not the best counselor. You want a warm hug? Jack Hensley got COVID. And all he wanted was his pastor to come over and hug him. I told him even if he didn't have COVID, I wasn't going over there to hug him. All right? So he gets mad. And I tell Jack, same thing I tell you. Suck it up. You want a hug? He's married. Hug his wife, who is in quarantine, so he can't hug her. So I ain't, I ain't taking her place. Let's move on, okay? But some of you are dealing with anger. You're mad at your boss because they demand too much. You're mad every time you look at your paycheck. You're mad at that guy named FICA. Okay? All right? Or you're, you're mad at what's going on, and you just get mad at the world. I will give you one answer to this. Stay off Facebook. All right, get off social media if you're mad. Read my podcast. They're, they're hilarious, my, my blog. Moving on. So some of you are dealing with anger. Some of you are dealing with favoritism. This might be by class, by race, by influence. It says in chapter 2, and this Bible doesn't have but one side, and I have to keep turning the page. I'm mad at this, okay? I need to deal with that. It says in chapter 2, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothes comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothes, he's saying some of you are favoritism, racist. Some of you are dealing with, you know, classism, whatever it might be. You look down on others. Maybe they're single, they're married, they're old, they're young, they're naive. They drive a Chevy, they drive a Ford. Okay? You may get mad and so you, you show favoritism. And some of you are dealing with that. You don't like blacks, you don't like whites, you don't like blue, you don't like red. I made a joke one time in my first month here about Hillary. And some of you got mad. You know, in the same, same breath, I also made a joke about Trump because I'm an equal opportunity offender, okay? But we show favoritism way too much. God came not to save the nation. God came to save people. And anytime you show favor, I'm not going to get into it. Come back, chapter 3. Some of you are dealing with selfism. It says in chapter 2, it goes on to say that, you know, you think more of yourself than you should. It says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warm. Basically, some of you, I'm needy. I, I'm, some of you come in and kind of, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm financially stressed, and you kind of go, I'm praying for you, but you don't do anything about it, and you walk away, you're being selfish. I'm not saying you're to give them money and bail them out of a problem, but maybe you need to come alongside them to walk alongside them. Maybe finances is right now something that can help, but maybe it also might be teaching them how to handle finances. All right? A couple of months ago, I walked out of here, and five of you told me, Todd, you got a flat tire. Four of you walked away. One of you, thank you, Mr. John, on Hamilton, he says, come on over and we'll fix the flat. We'll, we'll pump it up. And he took me to his, to his house. And, and he sat there and tried to show me how to fix it. And I said, just, just, just don't, te just, just do it, okay? And then his three-year-old came in and fixed it. I don't know what you teach those kids over there, John, but they know what they're doing. But some of you are like, oh, man, he's got a problem and you walk away. What does the church say? When there was a problem, they took care of each other. Some of you are showing favoritism. Some of you are showing self -esteem. Some of you are jealous. Not many of you, three ones, should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we will teach and we judge greater. Some of you, it may not be about you don't want to be up here in the pulpit, because you <laughs> don't want that, but you want the power and you want the authority and you want to be able to tell the leader of the church what to do. James has a word for you too. I do as well, but you'll have to wait till chapter 3. Some of you are dealing not only with jealousy, some of you are dealing, James says here, there's somebody here dealing with, and I got a word for you, that you cannot control your tongue. I deal with this. I often speak before I think. 
I often make a joke about something, then after it's over, I go, what an idiot. Not you, me. If SMH could be a lifestyle, it would be Lisa's lifestyle. Shake my head, because sometimes she just hears me talk and she just goes. And some of you are dealing with tongues. And maybe it's not the verbal tongue, but I've read some of your Facebook posts. James has a word for you. Some of you are dealing with what in verse 15 of chapter 3 talks about the secular, carnal, natural man. And it goes on, <clears throat> verse, uh, chapter 3, doesn't say verse 15, verse, verse, five, verse 6. The tongue is, a, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly and unspiritual. So you're, you think you've got it all together because you've rationalized everything and reasoned it all out. Do you know what James calls that? Demonic. If your reason comes from reason and wisdom of this world, you've got a problem. James says you're being demonically influenced. James got a word for you. Some of you are dealing with, you like to argue. You like to cause conflict. Yes, I've read your Facebook post. And you kind of think, but I'm encouraging my brother. No, you're slapping your brother and expecting something. To, you know, you're trying to pick a fight. I am the youngest of four. I understand what it means to have someone pick a fight on you. My brothers beat me up constantly. So I learned to run to mommy when I was like one. All right? Even when I was two years old. One of my earliest memories, I think I was three years old, and I was living in Hampton, and my brothers threw all my toys into the goat pasture and made me cry. And my mom made them get into the goat pasture and get the toys. They had to flee the goat, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you are dealing with having to cause problems and argument. Some of you are dealing, chapter 4, 16 says you're dealing with pride and arrogance. And he says, this is evil. James got a word. If you're dealing with that, some of you are dealing with materialism. You're dealing with, I've got to have this to be happy. I've got to do this. You're, I have to be the way of the world. And James says, I got a word for you too. Some of you are dealing with impatience and grumbling. You want things and you want it now. God, give me more patience. Why haven't I gotten it? You're grumbling about life. The pastor talks too fast. Don't get me wrong. I try to slow down, but I just can't. Right? Don't get me wrong. And I get it. But... There are some people that just grumble about everything. And then in chapter 5, verse 14, he says, some of you are sick. This is not something of your own doing. You're just sick. But the problem is you're trying to deal with it on your own. I don't want to tell people. I don't want people praying for me. But it's been about 20 years ago now, about 15, 18 years ago now, I had hip surgery, a hip replacement. And it took me eight years to figure out what was going on in my life. Finally, they figured it out. And they said, in five years, I need surgery and all this going on. So time was coming to the point. I was going to have to have hip surgery. I lived in Louisiana. And I was just going to take a couple of weeks off, not tell anybody. And to be honest, I wasn't the pastor. I was the associate. And me, the pastor and I did not get along. It wasn't my fault. It was his fault. But we res I respected him and all these different things. But we had different philosophy of church. And to be fair, they brought me in because of that. The pastor did not want me. They brought me in because they had five staff and they wanted one to be different. And if there is one definition about me, different kind of fits. But when you're in the, you know, everybody there hunts, everybody there fishes. My landlord hit a squirrel in his truck and threw it in the back of the truck for, so he could have gumbo that night. You know, that wasn't my world. They had wild game nights, so I brought Popeye's. All right, that's, that's as far as I'll go. You know, it's spicy. But I don't even know where I was going with all this. But it was the aspect, oh, my hip surgery. It was the aspect that he forced me the week before I had surgery to come down and have the deacons and others gather around me to pray. I did not want it. I did not want the attention. But the family of God circling around me that day changed everything about my attitude of the surgery and about church. Some of you are sick 
And it may not be physical, it may be emotional, it may be spiritual, it may be relational, and you're trying to handle it on your own. You want to know how to handle it? Come back in about two months. We'll get there. Some of you are strained. James is a book that talks about the priority people. We are the people of God that are wandering away, and we are to be the servants of God. And the point he is trying to get to this is, in this messy world, you need guidance. You need godly wisdom. You need to know how to live. And James doesn't give suggestions. He gives commands. So I'm telling you, pay attention. As our praise team makes their way back, Here's the challenge of the song. God, you'll never let go. God, you are always with me. You are enough. One thing remains. It is about you, O oh Lord. And I ask that you change my heart. And in this struggle of life, in this messiness that I'm going through, in the, in the stumbling that I will have, sometimes I'm going to probably be on that high wire just holding onto the wire, dangling down, trying to crawl back up on the high wire. But in this life, I need to know, no matter how much I mess up, God's ways are always there. And God's faithfulness is always true. He wants you to know that in this world, whether you are seven or 107. God's with you along the way. But faith doesn't sit still. Real faith works. It works in our lives and it works out of our life. May that be our call. If you need prayer this morning, I don't normally haven't been opening up the altar just because of COVID and restrictions, but maybe you want to come down and just pray. Just sit on the front pew or maybe, and I, and I, Gently say this. You know someone is going through something. Put on your mask and maybe walk over to them and just say, can I pray for you? I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. If you're sitting in the back areas where masks, you know, try to, try to be respectful of people. Don't have to get close. But just get in their area. But you need to know that we have a God that's with us every step of the way. And He wants you to know He's got your back. Father, your book right here, the book of Letter of James, speaks to me, speaks to people. And you're shouting out, there are things that need to be addressed. And you will address them. But the beauty is that James, who saw the resurrected God, he knew his power and the reality, we have that same truth. We have that same proof. Jesus, you are alive. And we want to serve you. All our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing this song?
that James will be a book that is more than just an, an intellectual challenge. It is something that challenges the way we live. So I hope that you will join us each and every week. And next week, again, we're going to start writing the book out. But this week, reach out to those. Make a phone call, an email. Tell others that you just were praying for them. You care about them. There are people out there that are struggling. And we need to be the family of God outside these walls. May we share his love, joy, and all that goes on. And next week, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. Join back as we see what that actually Jesus is trying to tell us through his word from the letter of James. May God bless you. May we leave this place stronger, closer, and more powered by the Holy Spirit than when we walked in, being his light and salt in this world. Y'all are dismissed. Amen and amen. Amen.